Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. My guest today is legendary winemaker Joel Peterson, founder of Ravenswood, one of the early iconic wineries in Sonoma, California, with its distinctive label. Joel is well known in the wine community as the godfather of Zinfandel, a grape that he popularized through Ravenswood. He was inducted into the Vintners Hall of Fame in 2011 and is included in the Smithsonian Museum exhibit on food and wine. Ravenswood, which started as a small 327-case winery and grew to nearly a million cases, sold one in every four bottles of Zinfandel consumed worldwide at its peak. Ravenswood went public in 1999 and was acquired by Constellation Brands a couple of years later. The acquisition moved Joel towards the business end of things as a senior VP of Constellation Wine, which included spreading awareness and knowledge about wine around the world. In 2016, Joel went back to his artisanal roots with his new brand called Once and Future Wine. Its logo is as distinctive as Ravenswood's. And he's back to making great wine from some of California's oldest and most prized vineyards. Joel combines what I see as the art and science of winemaking. He embraces science to advance the art, but believes in expressing the personal touch of the winemaker. It's refreshing to hear him describe wine and winemaking in simple English that everyone can understand. It's always a learning experience talking to him about the history of wine and its many facets. Joel, welcome to Brave New World. I am truly delighted to have you on the show. Thanks, Vasant. I am delighted to be here. It's a, it's a great privilege. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about the art and science of wine. But before we do that, I, I think of you as sort of as a bubba in the wine industry. Everyone knows you. But <laughs> uh, for the benefit of the listeners of the show who come from all over the world, Tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, because you were a scientist before you became a winemaker. So tell us a little bit about your journey from that to being a winemaker. You know, I like to say that I was part of the Lucky Sperm Club, not because my parents were rich, but because they were really intelligent, interesting people who did a lot of stuff. My mother was a nuclear scientist who worked on the atomic bomb at Oak Ridge. My father was a physical chemist that worked for Shell Development. Uh, and they did stuff, they, and they engaged their children in doing stuff. So instead of buying a house, they built a house. Instead of uh, sending your car off to the shop to get it repaired, you repaired your car. Uh, so they embraced things fully. Um, and in about 1952, uh, when, after my mother had stayed home with us, my bro- I have a brother who was born in 1950, she got a little bored, yeah, being an intelligent woman. So she decided she'd learn to cook because it was kind of like chemistry. And she read a book by Elizabeth David, said the French drank wine with their meals. And she said, wow, that sounds really interesting. Let's see if we can find a bottle of wine. She wanted to find a bottle of French wine. So she ended up going to San Francisco to a place called the City of Paris and asked for a bottle of wine that would go with this for a celebratory meal. And uh, the guy gave her a bottle of 1945 Chateau Neuf de Pop, which was the best vintage in France for many, many years. And that rocked my parents' world. They embraced wine and food the same way they embraced everything else. My father started a wine newsletter. They were founding members of the Berkeley Wine and Food Society. My mother ultimately ended up uh, recipe testing uh, the recipes for Alice Waters' first cookbook, the Chez Panisse cookbook. And I was a beneficiary of much of that. Uh, Not only did I get to taste great food, but my father uh, decided that when I was around age 10, I should learn how to taste wine as well. And essentially, the mantra was, shut up and spit. Uh, and <laughs> except that he would ask me how things tasted and I would, um, 
I would give him something. I might say, this wine tastes like apples. And he'd say, what kind of apples? And I'd say, I don't know. And he'd go out and find apples of different varieties. He'd cut them up and we'd smell these cut up apples until we could tell the difference between Northern Spy and Golden Delicious and Rome Beauty or whatever it was. So I really grew up in a household that was totally engaged in many ways in food and wine. Never thought of it as a uh, vocation, which is something you, people did for fun. And I went off to school, like everybody else, and ultimately went to Oregon State and got degrees in microbiology and general science. And, you know, my goal was to either go to medical school or um, go into medical research of one variety or another. But I got sidetracked along the way and, um, and ended up spending a year traveling in Europe after driving ambulances in San Francisco for six months. Uh, and then I came back and ended up being involved with a, a laboratory group that was working uh, on immunology with T cells and tumor cells and such things. And as I was getting ready to head off to grad school, I ran into a guy at a tasting whose name was Joseph Swan, and that created a swerve for me. He needed some help at his winery, and let's say I was living in Berkeley, doing a lot of Berkeley things. I had long hair. I had sort of that kind of back-to-the-land feel uh, that was going on during the time, and I spent a lot of time with Joe Swan. Basically, I learned the nuts and bolts of uh, winemaking from Joe. That started in 1972. And by 1976, I had some kind of a madness that made me want to start a winery. And so in 1976, I started Ravenswood. I made 327 cases of wine, Zinfandel from Old Vines, because it was the heritage of California. And then it just began, got kind of out of control. You know, I worked at it for a while, got my first really important write-ups uh, in the 1980s from Robert Parker, which kind of put me on the map. Uh, the winery began to grow. I found partners, a guy named Reed Foster, who was a wonderful guy, also was a Harvard MBA, so he understood the business part. I used to say I handled the purple stuff, he handled the green stuff. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it, was a good, uh, it was a good partnership. And the winery grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. So we started out as an LP, and then we went to a S Corp, and then we went to a public corporation. And we went, we went public with a guy named Bill Hambrick. And Bill Hambrick was Hambrick and Quist. Hambrick and Quist, but it was post yeah. Hambrick and Quist. Yeah. Uh, Bill was running his own company by that time. And we were one of the first people to do an open IPO or a Dutch auction IPO. Bill wanted to do it with bigger companies, tech companies, which were going the IPO route, people like Google, et cetera. But he wanted to do it with a, a lifestyle company first. And it turned out that after he'd done some research, after Gallo, and a couple of other people. Ravenswood was one of the best known wineries uh, at the time. And he thought that we might be a good candidate for that. So he convinced us that that was a good idea. So a Dutch auction is a little different. I think it was actually developed for selling tulip bulbs by the Dutch. But you actually have an auction, literally. People put in bids for your stock. And the way the price of the stock is ultimately determined is that you count down from the top bid until the entire lot is sold. And when you reach the final bid, uh, that's the price of the offering. So the offering may have started at $10,000. So if somebody really wanted the stock, they'd put in a $10,000 offer, knowing they'd never pay that much. But the bottom offering might have been nine dollars and 95 cents uh so everybody would pay nine dollars and 95 cents for that stock the idea was that it was to kind of diminish the bump you know big um big investment banks were pretty much in charge of how ipos were run and they'd sell stock to their patrons at a discounted rate and then they'd drive the stock price up and then they'd sell 
uh, that stock into the market. So it created a bump for the for the stock, and then it bounced back down. Probably wasn't good for shareholders, and it probably wasn't particularly good for the companies either. So Bill's idea was that he could get around this by going with the open IPO. It was fascinating, actually, going to the institutional buyers and doing the roadshow and all the rest of that stuff. Saw parts of the world I never imagined that I would see. But ultimately, you know, we ended up being a public company uh, for about um, two years. Uh, and then Constellation came along and we were purchased by Constellation. I got everything from love letters from my shareholders to hate mail. People <laughs> said, why did you sell to that big company? We love being a part of an ownership of a winery, da, 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 da. And others would say, oh, thank God you've made me rich. <laughs> not, not really. It was unusual, right, for a winery to go public? Uh, it was the unusual. Time. There there were a couple of others. Um, yeah, Robert Mondavi had gone public. There was um, the Shalone Group, which was another public group. None of them were particularly successful as public companies. It's a very unique business model, and it doesn't really work too well on a sort of a quarterly basis idea, uh, profitability, et cetera. Uh, if you're making beer, for instance, the only lim rate limiting factor in making beer is how fast you can get the ingredients to the fermenter and how fast you can get them in the bottle. So it's a great model for public companies. Uh, but wine, you get to make once a year. And it's an indeterminate thing. You don't know how big the harvest is going to be. You can't plan ahead. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. The wine market is up and down. Uh, sometimes there's too much. Sometimes there's too little. You know, it's just a bad model <laughs> for a public company. <laughs> unless unless you're huge, like Constellation, and spread out between you know, marijuana and beer and wine and spirits, you know, you know. so they, they've, they've spread the risk, so to speak. So how did you acquire the name or the nickname, the Godfather of Zinfandel? Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I think that's because I have spent my entire career sort of nurturing uh, Zinfandel. When I first started in the wine business, You know, Cabernet and Chardonnay were beginning to make their, you know, their full ascent. And other grape varieties were important in California. But the grape variety that had been California's grape variety for since the 1850s uh, was Zinfandel. It was a very important grape in California. And it was a grape that adopted California. And I grew up drinking European wines. And so my way of looking at the world was a more European way. You know, if you're in Bordeaux, they're not growing Pinot Noir, they're growing Cabernet and Merlot and Cabernet Franc and et cetera. If you're in Burgundy, they're growing Pinot Noir, but they're not growing Cabernet. The point is that different regions are suitable for different grapes, and they've arrived at that suitability over a long period of time. And it turned out that Zinfandel uh, arrived in 1852 in California. By 1888, it was the most planted grape in California because it was the most appropriate for the climate and the, uh, and the kind of viticulture that was being practiced in California at the time. So it had kind of been forgotten. It had kind of been re relegated to the backwaters. One, because it wasn't being made very well. It was mostly the ju jug wines and sweet wines and things like that. But I had been influenced by people like uh, Joe Swan, who was making a great one, and Ridge. And they didn't set out to be making great Zinfandel. They set out to practice, quote, making Pinot Noir or Cabernet Sauvignon in, in, in the case of Ridge. But they were practicing uh, until their vineyards came into bearing on Zinfandel. And they treated Zinfandel with respect and they made it like they were going to make their best quality wines. And it turned out that it was fabulous. It was really good. Uh, and so I uh, you know, decided that that would be the way to go. It was a mystery grape. Nobody knew exactly where it came from. Uh, it, was, um, it was pretty much thought to be California's grape. And we knew it came from the East Coast. You know, we later found out that it came through New York to get to, uh, to the West Coast in the 1820s. Um, but because it was widely planted and because 
the vineyards were very old, I had an opportunity to make a wine that was uniquely California, low cropped, dry farmed, all the things that you think about that produce great wine were associated with great Zinfandel vineyards. And so I guess that I made a lot of it. <laughs> so, so, where did it so, so, so where did it come from originally? How did it get to New York? Got to New York when a guy named George Gibbs, Colonel George Gibbs, who uh, lived on Long Island in that uh, hotbed of grape growing, Queens. Uh, <laughs> he had I know houses. it well. Uh, traded traded a set of rocks that he had collected with the Austro-Hungarian Empire collection at the Schoenberg uh, for grapes. And one of those grapes was called a dark black German grape, which turned out to be Zinfandel. And it turned out to be not German as we understand it. But in those days, any place where they spoke a Germanic style language was Germany. We now know that it came from Croatia and uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire included that. So it got to that. It was first cataloged by a game named George Prince, who uh, put it in his amphilography and called it something like Zifferdil. It wasn't Zinfandel, but it got transmuted to, to Zinfandel eventually. And Prince and a lot of other people came out to California uh, during the gold rush. And they didn't always find gold, but they did find this amazing place for growing things, grapes included. And a grape culture was started, and they were nurserymen. They brought a lot of the cuttings that they had in uh, hot houses in uh, on the East Coast, places like Boston. You know, we know that the first cuttings that we can document came to California with a guy named uh, Frederick McCondry, who planted them first in San Francisco and then moved them up to a guy named Joseph Osborne uh, in Napa Valley. Um, Unfortunately, Osborne couldn't get along very well with his um, neighbors or his employees, and one of them shot him. And that moved the entire uh, viticulture of Zinfandel over to Sonoma, where General Vallejo uh, lived and Boggs and others. And they basically adopted the scrape, and then Heresty showed up. And Heresty wrote really the first treatise on grape growing in California, and he was in love with Zinfandel. Uh, did a lot of things with Zinfandel, made a sparkling wine out of it. Actually, his son made the sparkling wine. Uh, so it was a, it was, it was, a, it was amazing. But, but we know now, based on because we were able to use, you know, modern PCR techniques, polymerase chain reactions, to uh, analyze the DNA of this grape uh, and compare it with other think, other places in the world. We know that it was related to a grape called Plavatsmali in Croatia. But we couldn't find, uh, and this was mostly Carol Meredith's work, along with uh, Eddie Malatik uh, and Ivan, Ivan Pejic in, uh, in Croatia. They went basically on Zin safaris looking for Zinfandel in all these vineyards and comparing DNA. And they finally found something that they called Zerlianac Kastelanski in Croatia that matched the DNA of Zinfandel in California. And then, really, that doesn't seem quite right because that means the red grape of the castle or the black grape of the castle. And so they kept searching until they found another little patch of it. Uh, and the woman who owned that patch said, oh, it's called uh, Privy Drag. And that was an interesting finding. And then they found a amphilography, a book of leaves that had been pressed and collected by somebody in 1920. And they took a punch of one of these leaves and they were able to determine that it was in fact Zinfandel, but it was called Tribidrag. And then they began looking at the history, now that they had the right name, of Tribidrag. And they find out that it's an incredibly ancient grape. The first reference to this grape is 1540. That was before Columbus sailed the blue in 15, 1492. I'm 1490, 1450, I'm sorry. Um, so it was a, it, it's pretty amazing. It turned out it was the grape that the Venetians grew on the Dalmatian coast. They actually owned that whole part of Croatia at one point. 
uh, and they set up a chain of castles uh, to keep the Saracens from invading. Uh, and those people grew, you know, Tribidrag or Zinfandel. It also happened to be the uh, favorite grape of, or wine, of Marat the pirate, who was a Barbary pirate, um, but he was actually a Scotsman who had managed to fight his way to a chieftainship at the Barbary. So, you know, so it's got quite a history. So I like to say that if, you know, if you'd gone to a mask ball in Venice in, you know, 1300 uh, you, and you were drinking red wine, you were likely drinking Zinfandel. Wow. How about that? I mean, that's uh, that's quite a history, you know, and talking about DNA, I want to sort of, I guess, get to the question that I started with, which is, or rather not a question, but, you know, I was talking about wanting to talk to you about the art and science of wine. And, you know, in preparation for this conversation, you recommended this wonderful book to me called uh, An Ideal Wine by David Darlington, which I noted is dedicated to you. And it's a fascinating read. I mean, I just learned so much <laughs> reading that, you know, and like most uh, wine drinkers, you know, my knowledge is just so fragmented, you know, it's sort of picked up from here and there over time that it really sort of brought a whole lot, a bunch of things together for me. So great book. I guess the only criticism I would have of the book is that the chapters are called chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, you know, as opposed <laughs> to, you know, having a title. So you have no idea about what's coming, but it was a fascinating read. I just couldn't put it down. But, you know, in that he sets up winemaking by contrasting these two characters, Leo McCluskey and Randall Graham, being people at sort of two ends of the spectrum in terms of winemaking. You know, and as a data scientist and a, and a data person, I was really intrigued by how uh, relevant data and technology is, you know, is to the wine industry. And so I'll start with a quote from the book, just to set up our, our conversation, right? So he says, while traditional wine science concerns itself mainly with quote unquote primary chemicals, things like sugar, alcohol, and acidity, which play a metabolic role in plants and determine basic standards of acceptability of wine, McCluskey was instead looking at secondary quote unquote flavonoids such as tannins, terpenes, phenols, anthocyanins, which affect texture, aroma, taste, and color, the foundations of what we call quality. And, and McCluskey actually refers to a study by an uh, Australian scientist called T.C. Summers, who published a bunch of papers, and where he claimed that the most durable color density was attributable to polymeric pigments formed when anthocyanins combined with tannins when the grapes were crushed and fermented. So this is on the one end of the spectrum, which is all right, the data and, and flavonoids and all of that. And on the other hand, we have Randall Graham, who says, you know, he extols in wine the sense of minerality, which he thinks is obtainable only from vines forced to root deep for natural water sources. And there was another quote I have, so just bear with me for another minute, which, you know, and he got into sort of wine, I guess, working in a wine shop owned by someone called Overstreet. And he says he would tell customers how the grapes had been packed by virgins caressing each grape between five and seven in the morning. But he could also be very technical, explaining, you know, things like botrytis, Cineria rot and saying, when you taste it, you'll see what I mean. So I was really intrigued by these two opposite approaches to winemaking. So tell us a little bit more about the history of these two people and these different approaches to wine and where we are now in terms of, you know, the extent to which winemaking is an art versus a science. Well, Leo is a very interesting character. Uh, he worked for Ridge for a long time, and he developed this interest in polyphenolics, um, the vicinal diphenol cascade, which is the linking of uh, polypheneric uh, phenols to create stability uh, and intensity in wine. And he ultimately developed a whole company called um, 
uh, you know, logics. And he would advise different uh, wineries that who hired him on how to achieve wines that would um, create a high score with a particular wine writer. He kept a database of a whole lot of wines that he had analyzed in, with his particular methods, but he also kept a database of high scoring wines uh, that were associated with certain wine writers. So he knew the profile of wines that Parker liked, and he knew the you know the general profile of wines that the Spectator uh, would rate highly. And he once told me that he could actually uh, tell me within two points of how a wine writer would score a wine. Then he added, I can do it within one point, but I always say two points in case it's not as accurate as I think it is. So that ultimately led to people chasing the score because scoring was critically important to the way wine was sold at that time. Uh, You have to realize that 75% of the wine in the world is the stuff you see on store shelves or grocery store shelves is produced by essentially three big wineries, maybe four, you know, Gallo, Constellation, the wine group. Um, and that's then the other 25% is produced by smaller wineries, small artisanal wineries uh, that, you know, struggle, you know, in sort of a very competitive set in that last 25%. So everybody's looking to create a difference. And one of the differences you can create is by getting a high score. The problem with that approach, of course, is that you know, you're going for Parker, and Parker likes a certain style of wine. And ultimately, you know, by making things by Leo's Leo's method was really to ripen the grapes to a certain point where they had the right ratios of anthocyanin and tannin. But ultimately, it produced uh, a lot of wines that tasted the same. And the beauty of the wine business is the diversity. uh, And that's where the art comes in. So the science is important if you're, you know, a big winery or a small winery trying to create a difference. But you can use that science in a way to create diversity and interest. Uh, I mean, really, if art is one man's vision of the world writ large, so to speak, then it really is up to the individual to create flavors and characters and interest in wine that wouldn't be there otherwise. So Randall, uh, who is the other spectrum of this, is, you know, Davis educated. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a, he has a viticultural degree, but he is also very much into the sort of how do you develop flavors that are unique and special? How do you make different wines? His current project is, he's, he's always been considered to be uh, kind of a renegade. He started the Rhone Rangers. He started making Rhone style wines in California before anybody else, Syrah, Grenache, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, he's created wines like um, Cigar Volant, which is, a reference to a spaceship that supposedly was hovering over uh, the Rhone Valley. Uh, and uh, but, but his current project is planting grapes from seed in a, a unique location. Uh, and let's just say seeds don't produce grapes that are like their parents. So if you plant a Cabernet Sauvignon seed, you're not going to get necessarily Cabernet Sauvignon. You're going to get some other cross. So he's got lots of these funny crosses in his vineyard, and he's going to make a wine that is directly related to what he calls terroir and uh, in that particular location. And that's the other thing about wine. Wine comes in lots of different iterations, and wine people like to talk about terroir. And terroir has to do with the flavor of a particular place. Uh, and that's not just terroir, the French call it, which would be soil. It's the climate. It's the soil. 
It's the viticultural practices. It's the way the winemakers think about wine and the traditions that they have that all come together to create a unique uh, style and flavor of wine and a wine that has a distinctive house flavor. So when I was younger, I could sit down and I think Morgan, my son, can still do this. Uh, I could taste, you know, 15 different Bordeaux blind and with some reliability, yeah, probably 80%, 90% confidence, I could tell you which chateau that wine came from because of the particular character that was associated with that location and all the things that were wrapped in to terroir. It's harder to do these days because there's more um, science in, in the mix. So they're using more technology uh, and the wines have moved closer together. So the art of winemaking really has to do with creating a uniqueness and a flavor profile that is representative of a human being and a place. So that's fascinating. So uh, what I hear you saying is that you could tell which area the wine had come from because presumably you had tasted enough wines from that area and sort of just developed that sense of that the terroir there was like is that am i understanding this correctly yeah i think that's i think that's accurate you know when i was you know when i got back from europe i put together several wine groups i'd already tasted a lot of wine uh, but we we would get together on Thursday nights for a cheap meal at the Basque Hotel, and everybody had to bring a bottle of wine in a brown bag. And we would pour those wines, and we would taste them, and we'd try to identify them and think about why they tasted the way they, they tasted. Uh, yeah, and there are still people that do that. There's a whole group called the Master of Wines, uh, and part of uh, the testing for the master of wine is that you have to identify wines blind and write about them and talk about why they taste the way they taste. Uh, so, yes, it does take time and uh, and focus to do that, uh, but you can do it. Fascinating. Yeah, I certainly can't do it, but then uh, <laughs> I don't have the palate or the experience, but I'm just fascinated that someone could actually do that blind and tell you which part of the world or specifically which with uh, vineyard or, or chateau uh, uh, wine came from. Amazing. So I want to come back to the scoring and the implications of it. Has that been good for the industry? I mean, has it, has it been good for the consumer? I, I, I would assume it has been because I grew up in India. There was no wine. There was no wine culture. And you know, my first exposure to wine was you know, when my dad was in Ethiopia and we'd go to these fancy, you know, he was a diplomat. And it was sort of, you know, tablecloths and wine, but I had no idea what this thing was. And people would sort of swirl it around and make strange noises and make a pronouncement, you know, but but that was sort of my exposure. And I guess most people really don't know a lot about wine, right? It's It just is the way it is. It's this sort of mysterious thing. We, we try and develop a taste for it, but most people don't know much about it. So has the scoring been good for people? You know, you, you just go for a 90 and chances are you're getting a decent bottle of wine for 15 or 20 bucks? The answer is yes. It's been good for the business. It's been good for wine in general. It's been particularly good for large wineries. Um, but it's also been good for small wineries. Uh, it's helped some of them out of obscurity and to get a better, better and bigger audience. It has its downsides. You know, for a consumer, it's very difficult to learn about wine. You can take wine courses uh, and you can taste wines, but it gets to be an expensive hobby if you pursue it as if you were uh, a professional, as it were. And if you want to taste the great wines of the world now, like Bordeaux or Great Burgundies, they're very expensive. Uh, they're you know, they're out, out of reach of most people. And so if you're buying an expensive bottle of wine, it's more difficult to take that step unless you've got an independent voice saying, oh, you have to taste this wine because it's really good. And it has to be a trusted independent voice. So people like Parker, who is no longer with us, unfortunately, uh, and Galoni and the Wine Spectator all have authority because they have done a lot of tasting. Uh, and they can separate 
the good wines from the bad. I should add that there are very few bad wines being made these days. Um, interesting, what, far fewer than when I was <laughs> first getting into the business. But their scores are not absolute. They talk about it being a 100-point scoring system, but really it's only about a 15-point scoring system. I don't think I've ever seen a wine rated under 85, and you rarely see a wine rated 100, so it's actually even more compressed than that. And if you buy a wine that is rated from 88 to 95, you know, it's going to be a very good wine. It may not necessarily line up with your particular palate or your flavors. So people who really, you know, are into this stuff find wine writers who most often um, correlate with their own tastes. It's gotten to the point now, though, uh, with things like Cellar Tracker, uh, which is um, an app that you can actually track your own cellar on, but you can also post notes about the wines that you drink out of your cellar, and you can score them. And they have a database of every conceivable wine. I mean, it's unbelievable. I've tried to find a wine that didn't have in their database, and I couldn't do it. And that wine will have somebody's comments and somebody's scores. So you now have the wisdom of crowds in scoring as well. So yes, it's very helpful if you are either a novice wine drinker or you haven't established your own tastes or your own desires. By, by the way, you know, as you were talking, I, I realized that one of the things I should have asked you earlier is how, how much noise is there associated with, with these scores? A few months ago, I had Danny Kahneman on the part, the, the godfather of decision of human decision making, <laughs> <laughs> which he's studied for forty years. You know, and he talks about the fact that human beings tend to be very inconsistent or noisy, you know, in their judgments. And so I was just curious, I mean, how noisy was Parker? How noisy are uh, the experts? And, you know, and and now that I, I think about it, when you said Parker or, or Leo McCluskey claimed that he could predict within a two-point range, well, you know, that could be like a 20% error, I guess, if you take sort of that compressed <laughs> range. And so, you know, that, that could be quite a large error, like two points in a compressed scale. Yeah, but the difference between a 93 and a 95 in the consumer's mind is not very big. Uh, no. And ultimately, it's pretty small. The answer is yes, there's a substantial amount of noise. I mean, you know, I think most good wine writers and wine evaluators uh, – try to compress that as much as they can. But you have everything from bottle variation to cork effect to what they had for lunch, whether they had a fight with their domestic partner, you know, all these things they bring to wine when they're tasting it. And there's really no way to sort it all out. It's just that they taste a lot of wine. And in tasting lots of wines, they're constantly comparing you know, one wine to another. I did a funny experiment once uh, just with a tasting group where I took all the 93 to 95 uh, uh, point scoring wines from Parker and had a group of wine professionals taste them blind and score them. And interestingly enough, the scores randomized out, I guess is what you would call it, from 89 to 95. And How about that? And then I took that set, and I took the top scores from that set and redid the same test. And once again, they sort of lined out. So what that tells me is that we, as tasters, tend to taste things relative to other things. And if we're asked to judge them and score them, we naturally try to spread the scores in an attempt to show perceived differences between the wine. It's not necessarily about quality because all the wines from 89 to 95 in that last round were very high quality wines. Yeah, so it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. So yeah, yes, oh, yeah fascinating. Yeah. Yes, there is, there is, um, there is noise for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like, you know, you feel forced to create that variance because you 
you know, I guess you feel it must exist, right? that, you know, they, they couldn't all be the same score. So even if they are all the same score, I guess you feel compelled to kind of, you know, create that variance. It's, uh, it, it seems to, it seems to be the case, but, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely noise, uh, in the scoring. It's, it is a human endeavor and, you know, ultimately there's no accounting for people's tastes. So even if Parker or Galoni or somebody loves a wine, it's no guarantee that you're going to love it. Talking about quality, price is usually or oftentimes a surrogate for quality. Is that sort of by and large the case in uh, the wine business where the price is proportional to the cost of producing it? Or does it have to do with how perfect it is? That what, what kind of a score you predict it'll get? You know, and as I'm saying this, I'm reminded of, I, I think there was a professor at Stanford who did a study that showed that people enjoy things more when they pay more for them. <laughs> so I'd say that wine's probably no different uh, from that standpoint. There was a study done with wine, in fact, where they took wines and they told the consumers who were consuming them the wines were uh, at a relatively high price point. And they they had the consumer cons- comment on all the wines and rate the quality of them. Uh, and then they took the same wines and told them that they were like inexpensive wines under $10 a bottle. And the comments followed it. The wines were not as commented on as favorably. The scores were lower. So, yeah, there's clearly a psychological part to the tasting wine. And uh, for sure. So how does a how does a outfit like Constellation decide on pricing? Pricing is a complex matrix for most people. Obviously, it has to do uh, with how much you pay for the grapes and how much it costs you uh, to produce the wine and what your overhead. If you have a big fancy winery, it's far more expensive to make wine than it is if you've got a tin shed somewhere. Um, but it's also priced on whether your wines are based on whether your wines have gotten a high score, uh, whether they're sought after, whether the Chinese want them, uh, whether there's a big demand for them. So, you know, the prices of Bordeaux and Burgundy have gone up in part because they're scarce. So that's the usual dynamics. If you're somebody like Constellation, you are trying to find a niche in the market where you can sell, generally speaking, a lot of wine. So you try to make a wine that is focus group oriented. So you bring a lot of people in, you have them taste the wine, you find out what they like. Uh, Constellation did a lot of studies on taste profile. And they came up with essentially four taste profiles, kind of the balanced tasteful profile, the winemaker taste profile, the vegetative profile, and the sweet profile. And then they tried to figure out where they were not making enough wine and where, which, which of these profiles had the most wine drinkers. It turned out that the sweet profile was an un, uh, untapped, with the exception of Apothic Red from Gallo, untapped area. So they began putting a lot of wine in theirs. They did an evaluation of what the cost of those wines was and what the cost of producing those wines would be. And then they sort of set up a matrix to figure out how much wine they could sell and how much they needed to make to make it profitable. So it was a very thought out process. And then they produced a wine to that price point. So they would go out and buy grapes uh, that were if they were trying to make an inexpensive wine that were less expensive, they would use high volume techniques to make that wine. Obviously, a lot of chemistry was involved. They would actually focus on a particular group of consumers with a particular wine that they knew they liked. And they would price it to appeal to that group of consumers. And it would generally be something like a grocery store wine or a mass produced wine, which is where you had lots of customers who were drinking wine. They wanted it to taste good. Uh, they wanted it to taste in a profile they liked, um, but they didn't want to spend too much money for it. Darlington described wines using tannin and color, tannin being low or high and color being pale or dark, and suggests that most people seem to like low tannin and dark color. 
Is that more or less what a lot of winemakers are shooting for these days? Yeah, and, and broadly speaking, yes. Uh, people who are kind of drinking casually uh, don't necessarily want to be intellectually or pal palate challenged. Uh, so if you can soften the tannin uh, in the wine, that makes it um, gentler, so to speak. It doesn't always make it a better food wine. It turns out tannin is really important for helping you know, cut the fat in that steak or you know, make, make the flavor of other meats and things like barbecue more interesting and make you ready to have more of it, so to speak. Uh, acid's important, but you know, too much acid you know, tends to put people off. And fruity and round, you know, let's just say that a lot of people were brought up on soda pop. And uh, the closer the wine comes to that profile, the happier they are. So where's the frontier now on in, in sort of the, I guess, the artisanal side of wine? It almost seems like it, there's two segments. There's kind of the the mass market, you know, controlled by large players. And then there's sort of the artisanal part of it, which I guess is, you know, let's say 25% of the of the business. Where's the creativity and where is technology going to sort of come in, do you think, and change winemaking, right? So we've already seen technology with Leo McCluskey, you know, where he's correlated these flavonoids to a predicted score. Even though, ironically, the computer can't really taste its own wine, right? so it can predict, you know, it can predict the score, but it can't taste the wine, right? That that's one area of perception where artificial intelligence has done very little. Like we have machines that can see and read and hear, but they can't taste. You know, machines just have no taste. And, you know, and uh, I, I guess there's a pun on that. You know, they can't taste. <laughs> So even though they may produce wines, they can't taste their own wine. You know, where's the scope for innovation and, you know, the role of technology in enhancing the capability or creativity of winemakers? Well, it's, um, it's very true. Part of what is happening in the wine business is that it's split into two segments. Obviously, the big segment, the more commercial wine segment, and then the artisanal segment where individuals are making wines uh, to their own preference using good winemaking techniques, uh, but that's quite varied. There are a couple of things happening now. A lot of younger winemakers are working with you know, grapes that have not uh, formerly been made into wine very often, things like Trousseau, Morved. Um, Mollard. I mean, there are lots of these uh, interesting uh, grapes that make really delicious wine. And we have in the modern world chilling and other winemaking techniques, which probably weren't available to our forebearers. Uh, so it allows us to do things uh, with wines that we wouldn't otherwise do, but it's also wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. But we're also using some very traditional techniques like, you know, stem additions and whole cluster and those kinds of things uh, to make wine. Where technology really comes in is in the vineyard. And that's probably the biggest change uh, that has happened for artisanal winemakers. Understanding how these plants grow and using, I suppose you'd call it big data, to understand what is happening in your vineyard. So you can use now, you can use everything from satellite imagery to, to other sources of probes of one variety or another to look at a specific site in a vineyard or a whole vineyard uh, to determine the health of that vineyard, the water status of that vineyard, you know, the ripening characteristics of any section of the vineyard. In some of the big vineyards, they actually have uh, machines that are programmed vine by vine to go through and pick the ripest vines or the best vines or the most healthy vines, as it were, depending on what their choice is. You can, you can cut the matrix a lot of ways. But you know, learning 
how to keep your vineyard healthy, how to keep the water status correct, uh, not too much, not too little, and how to sort of analyze the grape itself on the vine. They're working on machines uh, that look at the cluster to try and try to determine what the color concentration is in the grape while it's still on the vine to help you with picking decisions. So there are lots of techniques that are happening in the vineyards that are reliant on really modern technology. And that's, that's, and every winemaker will tell you that the quality of his wine is correlated with the quality of the fruit that he gets. And of course, people have sort slightly different definitions for what they want that quality to be. And that's, of course, what makes wine interesting. But uh, that is where some of the biggest changes are happening. The other changes that are happening for small winemakers is the ability to sell wine direct. Uh, wine used to be sold primarily through the three-tier system in the United States. It was kind of a throwback uh, to prohibition when they wanted to control everything and how it was sold. It was very expensive uh, to sell that way. It was also frequently very difficult because the distributors had condensed into a few very large distributors. And if you were a small producer, you had no leverage with them at all. So the whole advent of direct consumer sales and the loosening of interstate commerce uh, has made a huge difference to small wineries. But what it does mean is that they have to use their websites to reach out to the consumers. They have to convince them that their wine is good. They have to find some way to get them to try those wines. Uh, so that part of technology, the way communication has changed and the way we go to market is hugely beneficial to small wineries. It means they make 30% more on every bottle that they sell, and they're still selling it for less money than would have had to sell it for before. So it means the consumer gets a better deal, but it also means that the wineries get a better deal. It also means that instead of waiting 30 to 120 days to get paid, you get paid by credit card, which is instantaneous. It's a huge benefit for small wineries where cash flow is always a problem. Because when you make a wine, it basically, if it's a red wine, it sits in barrel for almost two years. That's pretty crummy cash flow. By the time you get it bottled and sold, it's almost three years. <laughs> so, by the way, has COVID increased the direct-to-consumer? People just buying directly more? I would say that it has. Uh, direct-to-consumer has been growing. It hasn't completely offset the loss of things like restaurant sales. Uh, but it has definitely saved a lot of small wineries. Consumers have been eager to embrace this whole uh, direct uh, to, uh, sale process. I mean, we've all gotten used to using Amazon and all the rest of the word, way, ways we deal with direct um, to consumption. And so wine works very well for most people, particularly if they're essentially a pre-qualified buyer, somebody who has tasted the wine or had a good recommendation for the wine or has seen it somewhere else. All those things uh, contribute to a consumer who is educated about a particular winery. Sometimes they like the personalities. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. I want to come back to the, the tech part and, and your reference to viticulture and, and sort of managing vineyards, which sounds fascinating. Are you seeing sort of an increasing use of field sensors in vineyards for measuring all kinds of things like the color of things, moisture content, et cetera? Is, is, is there more of a move towards that kind of sensorizing uh, vineyards? Oh, yes. There's no doubt that there is a, a huge move towards sensorizing vineyards. We have weather stations in all vineyards. Of course, vineyards have always collected a lot of weather data. But there are ground probes for moisture content. There are drones that can fly over the vineyard and look at the infrared radiation given off by the vineyard and other things. So, yes, it's becoming more important. It's becoming even more important because of labor issues uh, and 
So the more you can do to cut down on ha- what it takes to evaluate a plant. So for instance, water stress in a vine, you know, the way it used to be evaluated was that you'd do something called a pressure bomb and you put a leaf an individual would go out to the vineyard and put a leaf in the pressure bomb and measure the moisture in that leaf to determine whether it had enough water or not. But it turns out that there are aerial sensors that can essentially do the same thing. And so that takes that individual out of the vineyard. There are machines now that actually can help make picking decisions, as I mentioned earlier. You know, uh, and that sort of eliminates some labor. There are actually, you know, mechanical harvesters that have been around for a long time. And you can't use them on all vines, but you can use them on certain trellising systems. And those have been uh, mechanized in such a way that they don't actually make the decision, but but an algorithm makes a decision, uh, helps them make a decision about which grapes to pick and what part of the vineyard to pick, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is fascinating. It sort of makes me think that this is like... uh... Leo McCluskey moving upstream, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and I, you know, I heard you sort of allude to, you know, the fact that, you know, if you draw an analogy with uh, painters, then, you know, the grapes are sort of the, you know, the, the raw materials, the paint that provide the, the texture and color and all of that to, to the final product. And this almost seems like it's taking technology to produce better raw materials for for wine i think that's true it is um it doesn't take the human factor out of it completely somebody still has to program those machines and decide you know what they do and and how they're going to do it the machines are not independent of human decisions but not yet not not yet yeah well (laughs) (laughs) well well we'll hope that they never completely take over because there are certain there are certain people who love to make wine and love to be out in the vineyard. It's just part of uh, uh, of what makes a life worthwhile. Uh, and uh, so why would you want a machine to necessarily do that if you are successful at doing that? Uh, but, in, but in any case, um, the better your uh, input, the better the output. And machines have been very important in um, at this point in creating better wine inputs because of the quality of fruit uh, that you get and how you're able to manage your vineyard in a more effective way, uh, dealing with fungus and frost and chilling and heat and wind and rainfall and soil moisture and and spray at the right time. All those things are um, things that can be put into um, uh, an algorithm uh, that helps you make decisions about what you want to do and end up with a better result. Indeed. That's, that's the, that, that's the objective at the end of the day. So Joel, dumb question. I should have asked you this earlier, uh, but do you drink a lot of wine? (laughs) I taste a lot of wine. Yes, I drink wine. I have wine, you know, with dinner and I drink one glass of champagne every day just to celebrate the fact that I've outlived my father. I really had no idea that it would be 25 years, Uh, so it's been a long time drinking one glass of champagne every night. But uh, there are devices these days like Corvan that allow you to save a bottle for a fairly long time. So for dinner, I usually keep two or three bottles open and choose the one that goes best with my dinner. But I probably taste 100 wines a week. And really, I don't drink those wines in my mouth. Uh, I can usually determine everything there is to know about a wine from the way it smells. Smell uh, is really a, it really is taste in some ways. Uh, Your soft palate is the area where uh, most of the sensors for uh, aromatics are. So you use your nose for that and uh, the aromas go back to your soft palate. You pick it up there. And when you're tasting wine uh, in your mouth, uh, the same is true. Uh, While you don't always get the textural components of the wine uh, when you're smelling it, you can actually smell components like tannin in a wine, which is a textural component. So I can generally learn everything I need to know about a wine just by smelling it. And that's my primary method of evaluating wine. 
I'm assuming that the olfactory sense is essential to being a winemaker and finding that right balance between drinking and tasting is essential. There's a tight connection between taste and smell, isn't there? There is a very tight connection between smell and taste, and that is absolutely a requirement for any winemaker. Um, not only do you have to be able to judge wines by smell, but you know, you're know you surrounded by essentially an alcoholic addictive beverage uh, for some people all the time. And so to survive in the business, you need to develop a, uh, a very strict code of when you drink, how you drink, and how you evaluate wine. Not to mention the fact that if you're actually drinking while you're tasting, you can no longer um, have the same acuity uh, that you would have if you were not drinking in terms of sense, a sense of smell and taste. So yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a very important uh, skill to have, the way you balance it and, uh, and how you use the knowledge of previous tasting uh, to evaluate wine and to create your own wine. So you need ESP, extrasensory perception. Not quite uh, that bad, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of that. So, you know, what about the sort of business side of things? Like, what does it take to become a, a winemaker these days? Do you have to be rich to, <laughs> to, to begin? Or is this something that's still open to people without substantial means? It's very uh, open to people without substantial means. Now that I've started another small winery, Once in Future Wines, I am thrown into a community of other small producers, and there are a lot of them. There are people who started their own wineries. There are people like Cody Rasmussen, who started a winery called Desire Lines, who makes uh, Riesling, which is not a commonly made variety in California, uh, and Syrah does a beautiful job with those wines. There are people like um, you know Katie Rouse and um, her partner Corinne, who are specializing in unique wines like Arnais and uh, and uh, Valdegay, so varieties that are not widely used, but th those wines are beautiful. They are changing uh, the face of the business. There's a whole group of people uh, like uh, like Jack Edwards, who is at Magnolia, who is making natural wine, and he runs a custom crush facility to um, help other people make quote, natural wine. Not quite sure what that means, but that's a whole nother podcast. But these people all are willing to work a second job, like I did when I first started my started Ravenswood. And they are totally dedicated. Most of them have worked in other countries. They've worked for other wineries. Cody and uh, Katie uh, work for uh, another winery while they're starting their own fledgling projects. But they're doing it, and they don't have a lot of money. Their wines are in demand, and because of uh, direct-to-consumer uh, marketing and the internet, they're able to sell those products in ways that they never could before and introduce them to mar the market and to people who are interested in something unique and flavorful. That's great. That, that's great news to know that, in some ways, the barriers to entry have actually gone down. I think that's true. Uh, it, it's it's not easy, and you're not going to get rich real fast. Uh, you might be able to make a living at it eventually. I th I certainly think that group will. They are really the future of the California wine business. Uh, they are the people who are driving change within the business, and they are people who represent the best of what the business is. That's great. You know, it reminds me of uh, of something that John Sexton, one of my previous guests, said uh, in his advice to young people. He said, "Follow your passions, but keep your material needs." Low. <laughs> I think I think in this particular case, that is absolutely true. And there's there's a bit of an aesthetic uh, sense that you need to have if you're going to be in this business, at least for a while. Uh, you know, we think of it as being kind of food and wine, and you know, and and sort of over the top, but mostly on the production side, it is not. It is it is it is lovely, and it's it's a rewarding work because you're transforming, you know, something physical into something ethereal, and it's joyful. But it's uh, but it's not uh, kind of over the top uh, 
in a way that people might think. So, you know, talking about something physical, uh, you know, California has been in the news a lot in the last few years, you know, with fires and things like that. And and thankfully, they didn't, you know, they didn't ravage the, the vineyards. But uh, what are the challenges that the industry is facing these days, uh, especially, uh, you know, fruit growers? Well, you know, obviously, climate change has brought a lot of... Um trauma, if you will, uh, to uh, fruit growers, you know, grape growers in particular. Um, fires were just one of the things, and fires, of course, are an outgrowth of the drought, which brings a whole other set of questions. I personally, in 2020, lost about 30% of my production uh, to smoke taint, which is where the smoke affects the flavor of the grapes in such a way that it's not really palatable or interesting. Um, so we didn't make wine from one vineyard, and we uh, we had to uh, trash an, another set of wine that was fouled. But the drought is driving the fires, and the drought is also creating other problems. You know, the the wells are not replenishing as rapidly uh, as uh, they're being used in some areas of California. So while grapes don't necessarily require a lot of water and there is dry farming with the conditions of no rain at all uh, there is some water that's needed to keep them alive so i'm seeing areas for instance in uh, contra costa county where the lack of water is uh, seriously uh, affecting the vines ability to grow they don't need much water but there's so little water uh, and these vines don't even have any uh, expectation of getting water because there's no irrigation system on them, uh, that the soil organisms like nematodes are beginning to uh, destroy the, the roots faster than the vine can grow the roots, the new roots. So you're seeing shorter, shorter shoots and more trauma there. But you're also seeing other climate change effects. You're seeing the effects of extreme temperatures if you know, in the best of all worlds and what would be called a quality season the climate is relatively stable there's a high diurnal variation meaning hot days or warm days and cool nights and that has been changing you're seeing extreme weather events really heat storms in california you know frost storms in europe that have destroyed whole crops you're seeing that squeezing of the diurnal variation, so the days and the nights are both warm, and so you end up losing acid and brightness in the wines, and sometimes they begin to taste a little cooked. Uh, think of wines from North Africa, for instance. So there are a lot of those kinds of challenges facing us. Turns out, of course, climate change has been good for some regions. I mean, in Germany, for instance, where it was very hard to get grapes ripe and why they planted them on slopes next to the the rivers they and gauged and they gauged quality based on uh, sugar content uh it turns out now it's much easier for them to get the sugar content and they rarely have bad years same is probably true for bordeaux and in fact grape growing is moving to regions that formerly were thought to be less desirable or or just impossible to grow grapes in and uh the southern part of england would be part would be one of those areas uh it is um it is full of limestone it is really similar to champagne and they're making very uh decent uh, sparkly wine in england now uh, and starting to grow things like pinot noir and chardonnay Wow. So we might see uh, Pinot Noirs from England winning wine competitions by 2050. I think it's uh, very likely. It may not even take as long as 2050. The, the rate is going now. Wow. Sounds like the, the wine industry is kind of a canary in the coal mine when it comes to climate change. Isn't yeah, it? it's certainly a bellwether. Uh, you, um, you really have very few industries that are as closely watched and inspected by data uh, and by people evaluating wine. So changes are readily seen. The um, 
I think that the Germans have been collecting temperature data around the vineyards for a very long time. Uh, and they saw an uptick in temperature as the Industrial Revolution started. And they've noted there's a significant uh, climb in temperatures. I would say that for those people who are doubters that uh, about uh, climate change, they've never worked in a vineyard. Yeah. I think the other thing to say about that is part of the trauma associated with climate change is that it's very difficult to adapt to. You know, vineyards are not like lettuce. You can't just pick it up and move uh, to a new location. They're long-term investments. It takes a lot of money to plant a vineyard, and then you wait 10 years before that vineyard produces its best fruit. So it's hard to sort of imagine where to go. And if you go, how do you choose the right grape? for that particular location. And if you're wrong, 10 years down the road, you've like blown it. Uh, you know, people are attempting to adapt. Uh, people like Kendall Jackson are moving north uh, with uh, to, to Pinot Noir territory in Oregon, but the climate in Oregon has gotten as erratic as the climate uh, in California. There are those of us who are beginning to plant grapes that are from traditionally from hotter regions uh, so that we have uh, some more heat tolerance. So varieties from Portugal, say, you know, the Dao, um, Grenache from the Southern Rhone, those kinds of grape varieties. So there is some um, response, but it's a very difficult uh, thing to imagine. And when you consider the whole infrastructure that goes into creating wine, to move to a new territory is quite a daunting idea. So, Joel, what's your advice to young aspiring winemakers? You know, you mentioned Cody Rasmussen and a few others. Uh, you know, who do th- you know who are you know doing this? But what's your general advice to people who are aspiring to get into the winemaking business? Well, I would say you need to embrace it like you'd embrace a lover. You need to be a hundred percent into it. There are opportunities uh, that uh, uh, require uh, sort of diligence and patience. Uh, You need to understand wine, taste, 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 very important part of the business that teaches you how to, what the possibilities are and uh, gives you some general appreciation for the business itself. Get as much experience as you can. Have a, have a good set of computer skills because these days you really need to understand marketing and sales and how to keep track of your wines and what's happening in the vineyard. And a lot of that is on uh, computers. Have a knowledge of the possibility. Maintain f- flexibility. You have to be flexible. So those things are all uh, important. You know, so you so talking about computer skills, it also strikes me that there's scope in this industry for everyone, including the nerds, right? To build the new machines that the new drones that are going to, you know, do their magic and and all of that, right? So it, it looks like there's something in here for everyone. Uh, it's a broad based business, and yes, you're absolutely right. There are marketers, there are salespeople, there are nerds of all sorts, but and that's critical to the success and responding to the uh, the variation and the challenges that uh, the world we live in now poses. Uh, you know, so coming back to Leo, um, are his methods widely used in the industry these days? Well, I would say that there are not very many people at this point using uh, Leo's methods. When Leo started, it was uh, something new and interesting uh, and certainly a way of looking at wine, uh, but it was not a real substitute for um, the human palate and creativity that went along with it. And the problem with Leo's uh, method per se was that it defined wine quality uh, by high scores associated with a particular wine writer or critic. And it turns out that the wine business is dynamic. And people's flavor preferences are dynamic. So at the time Leo was working on that, you know, 
high alcohol, very ripe wines were in favor. And now those are falling out of favor. The grapes that he was working with were primarily Cabernet and the Bordeaux varieties, although he could work with other ones. But grapes respond differently and they produce wine of different texture and character that is evaluated differently. So ultimately, it became a, a, a sort of a winemaker's world uh, where they used began using their own judgment. And yes, they used some of the chemical analysis to help you know sort out what was happening with the grapes in the vineyard. Uh, I think going back to the changes that have been happening in the vineyard that uh, make wine better than it was. But I think there's also... Um, something happening in a big wineries. Big wineries are the people who could afford these kinds of analysis. And interestingly enough, people like Gallo, are, which are, who is huge, one of the big three players in the business, is doing things like buying fine wineries like Louis Martini and working with them. They've actually recently hired Randall Graham uh, to work on a project with them which is a long dock project, which is using grape varieties, which were normally produced in Southern France to, to make wines here in California using those same grapes grown here. And none of that fits into uh, Leo's paradigm particularly well. It's a dynamic changing business uh, and one static answer is not correct. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, you know, you'd mentioned once and, uh, once and future, What's happening there? What, uh, what kinds of wines are you making? Well, you know, when I left Ravenswood uh, in 2016, I had to decide what I wanted to do with myself. And I couldn't imagine not being a winemaker. Uh, and I didn't want to work for anybody else. And when I started Ravenswood, it was tiny. And, uh, you know, I had long hair and I'd lived in Berkeley and I was looking for a back to the land project. And it was going to be a small one man project making the best wines that I could make. Uh, so I decided to go back and have that winery again. So Once in Future represents that. And I am known as the godfather of Zinfandel. So it's heavily focused on old vine, single vineyard designated uh, Zinfandels. But I also make a wonderful uh, Petit Syrah from Palisades and uh, a lovely Merlot uh, from a cool climate region in the Carneros. And I'm having a ball. Uh, it's great fun, and I get to work with people I love, and uh, I get to interact with the market. And according to the critics, the wines are good, and I don't use Leo's method. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's even better. <laughs> I look forward to consuming all those uh, wines, Joel. I mean, uh, you're making my mind water. <laughs> uh, although, I, although I don't know whether that's the right expression for wine. What is it for wine? You don't. Uh, oh, you it's, know. Just, it's just that. Same thing. It, it's, it the, it's the desire right. to consume, uh, to enjoy. To yeah, be I, I, I certainly yeah, do. That's fantastic. You, you've, you've piqued my desire to consume more of those wines. I love it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, Joel, it's been a, a, a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise. Um, I guess in, in closing, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask you, how's, uh, how's COVID been? Um, and, uh, you know, what do you, I, I guess, uh, you know, almost everyone I know has been binge watching something or the other during COVID. So how's that been for you? And what have you been binge watching recently? Well, COVID's been, you know, actually pretty good. I actually don't mind, you know, uh, quiet, dark spaces. That's part of being a winemaker is you spend a lot of time alone <laughs> in a cellar. Uh, but, uh, but it also means that we've spent more time at home. I've upped my uh, my baking game. You know, it's just another form of fermentation if you're using you know sourdough and yeast. Uh, and of course, we watch a bit more TV. And uh, and I think that the two that we have been been what binge watching have been uh, Ted Lasso, uh, which is very funny and very well written and super well acted. So it's it's. It's kind of a spoof on British soccer, so to speak, uh, with a no nothing American in charge of coaching a team. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's on my list uh, it's, of uh, to dos. It's worth watching. It will it will brighten your day. Uh, yeah, and I think the other one I've been watching uh, that we've been watching with some regularity is 
Mrs. Maisel, which is set really in the 1950s. It's a woman who turns into a comedian. You can see that we've been watching lighter fare, but, uh, but the costumes are fantastic. Uh, once again, well-written, uh, kind of an interesting storyline, kind of you get sort of the inside perspective on uh, Jewish life and family life in sort of the 1950s. So it's, it's hilarious and also beautifully acted and very well done. Awesome. I look, uh, I look forward to watching both of them. Uh, I've been watching Yellowstone myself. That's this uh, ah. latest Kevin Costner uh, series. You know, lots of cowboys and, and buffalo in Montana, uh, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> which, which is, which is, which, is a, which is a bottle of wine my son just did in honor of me. <laughs> The oh, Montana oh, Symphondel, <laughs> because of one of my bad jokes. I I am uh, aware of that. <laughs> we'll save that for another time. Okay. Well, Joel, uh, thanks so much. Been fascinating, and I learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure my listeners did as well. So thanks again uh, for being on the show. Thank you, V. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for the good questions, and yeah. You know, if you have any more, just give me a holler. You know where I am. I will indeed. I might have you back on the show before you know it. Well, thanks again. <laughs> thanks, V. 